So do you want to get started? Um, do you want me to get started or do you want to wait for another two or three minutes just to let people join? We can definitely wait for one more minute and then you can get started whenever you're ready. Sounds good. I'm certainly glad we got that uh, technical That'll difficulty. It's, A little bit. There's nothing worse than when techies can't work an app or when geographers get lost. Things only go wrong on presentation days. Never fails. Um, but I think if, if you want to go ahead and get started, Sean, I think we've yeah, got sure. a good, good amount of people here. Okay, I'd love to. Yeah. Um, so are, are you recording? I just want to make sure. I am recording. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I, I, can, I, can, I can edit that. So let me turn on my video real quick and I'll say hello. So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Sean Lynch. I'm the founder and developer of Open Letter Map, uh, which I've been working on for a number of years. I started doing the research on mapping litter the day I was introduced to GIS. I was studying geography in university. I was the first year undergrad introduced to GIS and it was a game changer for me. Up until that point, I was strongly interested in video games. And when I was introduced to GIS, it looked to me like a video game using real world data. And I knew that I just I had to master this skill and I wanted to build a career using geospatial data um, in some format. So the day we were introduced to GIS, uh, we were asked to write a dissertation in two or three years time and just start thinking about applications for GIS. Um, and the first thing that came to my mind was to use it to map dumping and illegal dumping and waste sites. Um, and I, so I started doing a little bit of research into that. Um, and as soon as I realized you could use GIS to map dumping, uh, illegal dumping and, and large dump sites in particular, I quickly realized there was what I call micro litter everywhere. Um, and once I started looking at that, um, I really couldn't stop looking at that. So this resulted um, in the development um, a few years later of Open Letter Map. So Open Letter Map is an open source, interactive um, and accessible database of the world's litter and plastic pollution. Inspired by the open values, uh, the democratic uh, research community and the transparency of OpenStreetMap, I decided to apply the same open values to crowdsourcing data on litter and plastic pollution. Um, so uh, I did a master's uh, in GIS where I, I reviewed all of the available litter mapping frameworks and I found all of them to be largely inadequate. None of them did really anything that I wanted them to do. Uh, most of them focused almost exclusively on marine litter and microplastics on the beach or, or along the coast uh, and in the oceans. And very few of them were proactively looking at waste upstream where it began and how it's moving across space and time. So to try and achieve this, I thought, well, uh, why don't we? Do I, first of all, I couldn't believe that this didn't already exist. I thought there has to be something like OpenStreetMap for me as a GIS user to be able to crowdsource good quality data on the, the pre-marine terrestrial origins of plastic pollution. But it doesn't exist, um, so I had to develop the methodology and then teach myself how to code uh, and try and bring it into production. So the web app, OpenLitterMap.com, finally launched in April 2017, and the mobile apps followed uh, shortly after, but it's all very much still in development. So everything we do is open source. So uh, we'd love if you could come on GitHub.com slash OpenLitterMap. Um, it's built with a Laravel uh, PHP framework on the back end, Vue.js for um, reactivity, um, and a React Native on mobile apps. And we're currently working on uh, the litter, a the Open Litter AI, uh, which is an open source litter detection algorithm using 150,000 verified images and more. Um, so many people now recognize that plastic pollution is a huge threat to the environment. Uh, there's about 900 tons of plastic estimated to be entering the oceans every hour. 
the, that's an average from um, the estimated uh, between 8 and 16 million tonnes every year that's commonly thrown around in the media. But these inferences that are made based on waste management metrics in developing countries and population um, uh, estimates, um, uh, they're, they're, they're inferences. So they're actually lacking good quality scientific and geospatial data to more appropriately inform our understanding of how badly polluted the world really is. Are things getting better or worse? And how is plastic moving across space and time? And if you read into any of the studies that characterize there's nine out of 10 rivers, mostly in Asia, responsible for 90% of the world's uh, marine litter. The same authors recognize that there are large uncertainties with these figures because of a lack of data. That's not to say that plastic pollution doesn't have significant impacts on the marine environment. It absolutely does. But these figures detract from uh, where it's originating and the, uh, the, the, the lack of data is never reported on in the media. However, our knowledge about how badly polluted is is ripe for disruption because recently hundreds of millions of people around the world have been equipped with powerful data collectors that can collect high quality, accurate, verifiable geographic information, not only about litter, but about biodiversity, um, about the environment around us, etc. However, citizen science has focused almost exclusively on mapping biodiversity. But you need a PhD in ecology to be able to identify an ant or a bee or a fly. Whereas litter mapping has a very low barrier to entry because it's number one, it's everywhere. So you don't have to travel very far. And number two is that everybody already knows what litter is. Everybody now knows what a face mask is or what a plastic bottle is or a cigarette butt. So the objects that we're mapping are very approachable, very easily identifiable. To, to such an extent that I think litter mapping is probably the most accessible form of data collection the world has ever seen, making it an important catalyst to build up societies currently um, very low capacity at producing huge global data sets. So a few years ago, when social media came along, there was this huge explosion um, uh, uh, in conversation and, and even mainstream political dialogue about plastic pollution. So up until social media came along, our knowledge about plastic pollution was created and communicated in a very top-down, systematic, institutional-led process, whereby people with significant knowledge and expertise were the only people who collected data. They were the only people who, who wrote about these reports, and they were only really the only people who read about these reports. And the 99.99% of the population got their information from the news or newspapers or magazines. What happened is that when social media came along, it completely democratized how knowledge was shared in society. And suddenly huge numbers of people, hundreds of millions of people could communicate um, this, that, that the planet was really badly polluted. And I believe this is what made, uh, this is what caused a huge awakening of global pollution. However, although many people now recognize that plastic pollution is a huge problem for the environment, very little people are actively participating in data collection, even though everyone has access to a powerful device that can collect data. So 12 or 18 months ago, um, there, there wasn't much COVID and PPE related litter scattered around the globe, whereas now this has become almost globally ubiquitous. Uh, and many people now recognize this not only as a threat for the environment, but also potentially increasing the risk of community transmission. Uh, so I think PPE litter is probably the most um, well recognized um, and uh, topical element of perhaps an underdeveloped element of citizen science at the moment. And even though this is the, the, the COVID is a huge global pandemic, very little is known about the face masks that are now littered around the globe in their billions and that have been recognized as a threat for not only marine life uh, but also for human health um, so our knowledge about how badly polluted the planet really is is ripe for global disruption um, and these maps tell a very powerful story so when litter is mapped sean i hate to i hate to interrupt you i think we are still stuck on the oh there we go i don't know if the slides just video. weren't there so we did go. You, did, okay. Did you see this one? Uh, no, we were actually still just on the, um, the oh, opening no. slide. 
Okay. Well, this was the one about the uh, the all the litter in the oceans, and there's about 900 tons of plastic going into the oceans every hour, uh, and plastic is now recognised um, as a marine phenomenon, but very little is known about how it actually ends up in the ocean. This was the slide about uh, uh, how many people are now uh, empowered with data collectors. Um, and that our knowledge um, of global pollution is, is ripe for disruption. And that litter mapping has a remarkably low barrier to entry um, that, that can potentially bring many people into crowdsourcing data, not only about litter, but about the environment and about society and the world for the first time. And I believe that in a few years, uh, just as a few years ago, doing a presentation like this was something in a science fiction novel, I believe, too, that in a couple of years, producing these huge global data sets is going to become the new normal as many people empower themselves to actually use their devices for data collection for the first time. So when we all got our first device, it's pre-smartphone, its primary function was to make phone calls. But when the iPhone came out, it completely changed how we interact with our devices fundamentally. And they, they're no longer just a phone it's probably the least thing we use them for now is to make phone calls. Our devices are primarily and fundamentally data collectors. Um, and we're even though everyone around the world has is now empowered with a powerful device that can collect data, we're not yet harnessing this unprecedented human potential. But we're this is ready for change. And when we empower people to use their devices to map and share data on pollution, um, it's going to not only bring huge numbers of people into science and the public process um, and increase geospatial literacy, uh, but we will begin to finally crowdsource these huge global data sets. And I believe that will become the new normal in the, hopefully the near future. Um, so as I was saying, litter maps have a really powerful visual impact potential. I, so are, can you see the litter maps? I'm slide? so sorry, Sean. I think you might actually just have to click on the next slide. Um, if if you've changed it, I think now we're just kind of stuck on the the um the photo with Obelisk. There we go. Yeah, I think you just might have to physically click on the to get okay. to the next slide. Well, I'll I'll keep this open. I, and so you can see the the slide now of the litter mapped. Yes. Okay. So litter maps have huge um impact potential in how they reveal and communicate litter for the first time or with, with people who haven't seen it before. So for many people, litter has become normal and invisible and it's blended into the backgrounds of our, of our lives. It's become so ubiquitous that people don't even pay attention to it anymore. Uh, but when you when you map litter in a hyperspatial resolution where every piece of item is mapped and classified and tagged individually, Litter maps tell this really powerful story about, about plastic pollution in people's local communities. Uh, so although many people now recognize that plastic pollution is an ocean problem, when we map litter in more urban contexts, it brings that message home and it puts it in people's backyards. And if you remember the first time you were introduced to Google Earth and you could zoom around your neighborhood from space for the first time, everyone was doing it and it made mapping fun. But if we can map and reveal all of the litter and plastic pollution in people's local communities, uh, they're going to never look at the streets the same way ever again. So before we even dig into what's the potential of the data, the maps alone just have this huge impact potential and will reveal and communicate plastic pollution in new and unforeseen ways that will hopefully make a lot of people um, never look at their or at, at their devices or the, the streets the same way ever again. Uh, as well as the visibility that's created by litter maps, there's also a huge pile of research that can be done um, and problem solving and consultancy with local governments and businesses uh, with the data that's new and largely unexplored. Litter mapping is so new that not even a university campus or a town or a city has had all of their litter map yet. But if many people work together, it literally take about, you know, depending on how many people you've got, it could potentially take just a couple of minutes to cover these huge areas if everybody took a couple of photos each um, and picked up the letter after them and disposed of it as well. But for example, here in Ireland and in the UK, um, the central statistics offices um, develop what's called a deprivation index. 
and it's a it's a it's a measurement of how wealthy or disadvantaged an area is and it's a a statistical measurement based on a number of different census indicators like income and um uh you know single parenthood and uh, various other factors and i believe that not only will litter data correlate with the deprivation index so what you'll see is that more affluent areas pr are probably better resourced and more disadvantaged areas are are less well resourced but litter can potentially become another important indicator about how we measure deprivation um, and how we allocate resources in society uh, and, and make that distribution of resources um, more ethical um, and, and, and fairer for everyone. And what litter mapping does is it empowers people to, to advocate for local services in their neighborhoods. So when I started doing the research on mapping illegal dumping in my community, there's this area near where I live that's plagued by dumping and, and littering and antisocial behavior. And I wanted to use GIS because I could communicate this with the people and the city, the city, and then I could try and use the data to get it fixed. So when you empower people with litter mapping, you're empowering them to create geographical knowledge about problems and problem areas in their communities that otherwise they'd have to pick up the phone and start ringing for hours. And it's very difficult to get a message through and to get something solved. But when something's mapped, especially in an open and accessible way, um, it's very hard for authorities to turn a blind eye and to continue to negate services. Um, and when people are empowered with the creation of data and geographical knowledge, um, it empowers them to make a difference and to advocate for, for better services. Um, other applications of the data uh, include but are not limited to the um, relationship between open street map data and litter data such as open litter map data uh, for example you know the, the, you have a number of shops here um, on open street map and uh, what types of litter are we finding around them and, and what are the radiuses and buffer zones and um, you know different rings um, of interest that that we're finding along you know it could be motorways or um, you know, the side streets or back alleys or whatever. This litter is huge local contexts, um, but these remain significantly underdeveloped and largely unexplored. Uh, we could also apply biodiversity metrics to plastic pollution, looking at its diversity, its distribution, and its richness or uh, anti richness, if you want. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Can you see the next slide? Are we good? Yep, I was. Okay. Good to go. So download, thanks. Downloading Open Litter Map data is easy. You visit openlittermap.com and click on the World Cup, where you'll be given a list of countries that are uh, competing against each other uh, in the race to clean up the planet and collect data. So we're turning it, cleaning the planet. In, and if you scroll down and you uh, look for the country you're interested in, uh, on the right hand side, there's a download tab. And you enter your email and you get all the data downloaded to you as a CSV file. Uh, and this works for any location where data exists. Uh, and if your country or your location uh, does not exist yet, simply by uploading to Open Litter Map, it will automatically populate the list of available locations. So when you, when, when you upload to Open Litter Map, Megan, your mic is on. Just so you know. Thanks. Thank you. Um, when you upload to Open Litter Map, we get we we take the GPS coordinates from the photo, and we use those GPS coordinates to query Open Street Map, and then we get a range of address values. For example, the country might have a value of Ireland, and then we use those address values to populate the database dynamically. So as you're uploading photos and you're adding a location for the first time, you're adding new locations to Open Litter Map, and you can see that reflected by the created by stamp and or tag in the bottom left of the white box um, and that word there Ireland is actually a link so you can click into Ireland and access the counties or you can click into the US and access the states um, for any location We've, we're basically modeling every location around the world so you click into the US you get a list of states you click on a state you get access to the list of towns and villages within that state um, and every uh, location, you can you can download the data for every location, and there's charts and time series and, and leaderboards for every location where data exists. So next slide, hopefully you can see um, a little bit of what the data looks like when you download it. So from the left to the right, we'll go through this as painfully as possible, but there's a verification index. 
So when people upload data to Open Letter Map, we manually inspect and verify as much data as we can to remove as much ambiguity from citizen science data as possible and to give our, high, to give our data um, high confidence for the analyst. So this data has a verification of two, uh, which means it's been verified by an admin. We used to have a, a verification of one, whereby users could vote true or false on each other's images. Once a certain threshold had been reached, the image would achieve a stage one level of verification. But we, we don't use this anymore. Uh, all of our data has now reached stage two. Uh, and you can read more about our verification process on our GitHub wiki. And we actually have five levels of verification. And uh, we're about to start level three and four soon, which will be used to uh, draw bounding boxes around the images, um, which will be used to train the open letter AI for object detection. So we also include the phone model, and that gives you an indication of the spatial accuracy of the device. So various iPhone and Android phones will have different spatial resolution. Android phones typically uh, restrict the temporal revisit frequency of the photos. So if you're mapping something like litter in hyperspatial resolution along a street, the Android tends to cluster 20 or so photos at a time, whereas the iPhone will give you a continuous uh, spread of data almost interpolated between the points. You also have the timestamp, the coordinates, um, and the full open street map address at every photo or every location where a photo was taken. Uh, so if you look at the address column, that's actually the full open street map address. And one of my long term goals is to get the open litter map community who are very new to mapping um, and get them improving the address system in uh, their local communities and try and feed that data back into open street map. And then you can see that there's a total litter count and then every litter type is a column with a value in the in the cell. So we've predefined more than 120 different types of litter and 60 corporate brands who are responsible for producing uh, products that end up in the environment. And we tag all of them and it's all accessible as open data. And all of our data, because it's predefined, um, it's indexed, uh, it's quantified. So we don't deal with any strings in the cell. You're not going to see cigarette butt in 10 different languages misspelled. It's just all predefined and in the cell, you just get a number of the quantity of litter that was found in that photo. And the user can tag any amount of litter in a single photo and it's broken up by categories, which I'll show you next. So if you click into Ireland and you click into County Cork where I live and you click down to Cork City or any location, you're going to get a map like this. So this loads a very small amount of data um, in to the view. Uh, and the reason it does this is for two reasons, is that number one, we can draw these hexes um, and we get um, a, a, a point in polygon count of the number of uh, points that fall within um, a grid. And the second reason is that with a smaller amount of data, we can break up the data into categories. So here you can turn on the soft drink related waste and you can see where are the plastic bottles and the fizzy drink bottles and the straws and the plastic cups or you could turn on the alcohol related waste and get a, vi a visualization of where broken beer bottles and beer bottle tops um, and packaging is related or turn on the dog shit category to see where people's pets are leaving their waste behind them um, or industrial waste or sanitary like PPE litter and medical waste and things like that. So um, you can explore with this and you can get a, a, a visualization of how badly different types of litter affect your local community or anyone's local community. So next slide. So as well as the city map, we also have a global map. This is meant to be animated one at a time, but we'll walk through it. So my favorite thing about the global map, not only does it load all of the global map data instantly um, for everywhere, but we have live events. So as people upload uh, data, you're going to see those events happen live in real time on the global map. So you can just keep the global map open. And if a new user signs up or a new image is uploaded um, or one of several different events, like a new location is added to the database, or we also have a feature called Teams. So you can create a team like a company team or a campus university team. Um, and anytime one of these events happens, it's going to be broadcasted via WebSockets to anyone viewing the global map. Um, and you'll see in real time, people are out there using Open Letter Map and contributing to our open source and open database. The map clustering, uh, we were using Mapbox's Supercluster, which is just one of the most outstanding libraries for 
uh, getting uh, clustered data from, from a large number of points. We've got over 120 different thousand photos and it loops through them all in, in about two minutes. Um, and it gives us, what we do is we, uh, we take all of the um, data from the photos table and we loop over them and we save all of the cluster metadata into another clusters table. So when you view the global map, it doesn't populate all of that data dynamically um, from the database. That, that data has already been pre-processed and saved to another table, a database, a MySQL table. Uh, and when you view the global map, you, you're loading that preloaded metadata. So we, we uh, recompile that data typically about once every 24 hours. I need to write a command to do that um, uh, on schedule uh, more regularly. But at the moment, I, I update it manually um, or I run the command once about every 24 hours. Um, and the other thing is that when, when you zoom in past a certain threshold, I think it's zoom level 15, we don't load from the clusters table anymore. We just load the native points table uh, dynamically from that photos table where all of the photos data is saved to, including the coordinates. So if you zoom right in past uh, zoom level 15, nice and close, it's going to load the photos table uh, dynamically. So um, any new data that hasn't been pre-compiled yet will be included uh, at a, a higher zoom level. Um, and any data that's not verified yet will have a, a gray dot instead of a green dot um, to show that uh, this data has not been verified yet, but it, the dot will still appear just in one of any tags um, or an image yet. And the other really cool thing is about, because we predefine all of the data, um, the, every litter type basically has a key. For example, cigarette butts has a key of butts. And what this allows us to do is translate the tag into any language and any alphabet that we have uh, built into Open Letter Map, which on the global map is right now it's only English and Dutch. But if people speak other languages, um, we'd love if you could help us translate um, Open Letter Map uh, and make it more accessible for the global uh, citizen science and, and litter community. Um, and the, the litter data on the global map will be automatically translated into any language from any language. So people can use the app in one language and it'll automatically be ported to any other language when people view the global map. And so hopefully we'll have a bunch of uh, new user signups at the end of the presentation. So keep the tab open in another, uh, keep the map open in another tab. So using the Open Litter Map app, is pretty easy. I've tried to make it as easy as possible and remove as much jargon as possible. The user takes a geotagged photo with their location services on. The uh, GPS data is saved to the met in the EXIF headers. Uh, they then select the category that the litter is in. So they select the soft drinks category. And then at the bottom, the list of litter items will change. So they select a quantity of, you know, how many plastic bottles are in this photo. They add a tag and they confirm and they'll be swi swiped into the next image. And the user uh, continues to do this until all of their photos are tagged and they press upload and then everything will be uploaded on the global map at live events. This will become even easier when we launch the open letter AI. So that's our next step is what I'm currently working on is um, a tool to tag all of our images with bounding boxes. So we're going to draw a bounding box around every image and we're going to one hot encode labels saying that inside this box is a plastic water bottle. Um, and that will help our algorithm learn what the plastic bottle looks like. And hopefully in the future, people will be able to use the AI without having to manually tag everything. But that, that training data is needed uh, and we need a lot more data to do that effectively. Uh, even though we now have about 120,000 photos, um, we need a lot more if we want to make it really robust because litter is not as clean as a normal product. It comes in all different shapes and sizes and states of um, degradability and you know some of it's old and decolored and stuff. So we're going to need a lot more data if we want to build a really powerful classifier that can make citizen science much easier. I also have some really cool ideas for gamification, which I haven't shared publicly yet, but uh, that's on the horizon. Um, that'll be probably launched soon after the AI. I'm also working on Littercoin. So Littercoin is the first blockchain token rewarded for the production of geographic information. So I'm trying to create an incentive uh, that um, encourages people to collect data, particularly for the first time. Um, and there's a lot of people, there's a lot of hype around blockchain stuff at the moment. 
but I'm trying to lure those people into citizen science, make it more appealing for people and, you know, have a, a carrot at the end of the stick approach. Um, and hopefully with Lettercoin, I'd like to be able to reward um, zero waste products and services and tap into um, zero waste, the circular economy, basically. You've a lot of little zero waste mom and pop shops that are opening up and hopefully find a way where if people are out there picking up letter and doing good, uh, we can encourage uh, circular economic activity and uh, get people out of the corporate stores and the heavily online retailed environment and try and um, do something useful with cryptocurrency. Um, so we also need to build a community and we definitely need more people using the app and hopefully um, running events. For example, what we what I would love to see is um, a university challenge where universities compete against each other to see who can map the most waste and collect the most data. Uh, and we could potentially have Littercoin offerings then, and maybe the universities can work with us and, and offer some services or, or discounts to students who can who can make the biggest impact. Maybe we can talk about scholarships or, you know, those are the kind of things that are possible when you tokenize things and you, you encourage people to collect data. And we're going to try and make it as, as fun as possible to uh, map litter and uh, engage in data collection activities. And if the incentives are aligned right, if my model is not perfect, um, and we, we need help to try and, and, and build out every aspect of the platform. Um, but if the incentives are aligned correctly, and this is potentially becomes something people can do and actually um, create value from, I, I see no reason why it couldn't incentivize the most rapid production of crowdsourced data the world has ever seen and encourage people to if you remember when Pokemon Go came out and suddenly everyone was chasing these digital monsters, well, imagine if we actually took the same effort and um, emotion and uh, credibility and excitement, that's the word I'm looking for, and applied that to cleaning the planet for the first time. Um, it wouldn't take very long to get huge global data sets on pollution and start solving uh, reoccurring problems. Because people have been picking up litter for decades. Um, but it's getting worse. So clearly, whatever we're doing, it's not working. And I believe the solution to that is to empower people to use their devices to collect and share data um, and to apply to empower people to use their devices, but to collect data that will empower the GIS community. Because if, if cities are going to and if societies in general are going to solve huge geospatial problems, then we need huge geospatial data sets and we need to empower the GIS community. So what I'm trying to do is inspired by what happened at OpenStreetMap is to build a similar uh, community of people that are interested in um, applying the same open source values to litter and plastic pollution. So we need a lot more data, we need pilots, we need your opinions, we need your feedback, we need your criticism, and we need your help. So um, that's pretty much it for me. But if you guys have any questions um, or comments, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, before I ask them, um, can you tell me, please, if I understood the right concept? Uh, is this a real-time GIS system? I mean, the purpose to show the real-time information of the data. Um, it's 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 real-time and historical. So you have when you open the global map, that's real-time data that's coming in on the feed. If you look at that 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 live events feed, that's real-time data. But the global map um, it is historical data mostly. So it goes back about two or three years. But that's only because we only have about 4,000 users and maybe 10 people using the app every week. But as, as the app gets bigger and more people sign up to collect data, uh, we're, we're, we're going to change it to this is, this is the data that was uploaded today when you open the global map. Or you can say, show me the data from last week. We actually used to have this um, and we need to bring it back. So. Yeah, we, we're, we're doing both. We're doing real time and historical. Well, my question is this, because uh, yeah, in this situation, we have a GIS system that we have input of data, right? And uh, about the historical data, most likely, I mean, from my understanding, most cities and places are usually cleaned uh, periodically. And uh, uh, of what I have seen on the web page, people uh, taking a picture of a bottle or four or five cigarettes. Well, um, then how, how how is the the, the data the, that is duplicated controlled, right? Because 15 or 500 people can take the same picture on one place. And if let's just say that this becomes worldwide mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of people use it, 
well then uh, how it is going to be controlled or financed or something like that to data to be controlled i mean and my most important question is like uh yeah what happens when the data is removed i mean from the actual place mm -hmm. good questions yeah um so hopefully whoever's taking the photo will have the time to pick up the letter as well and it'll be gone but this isn't always the case and if you imagine someone's rushing to work in the morning and they see a bunch of broken glass they're not going to be down there on their hands and knees picking up letter so th there's a combination that that pe different people have different skills one person might collect the data city worker or a volunteer might come and respond um and um so not not everyone will do everything um but we haven't gotten as far yet as updating the map so when when something has been picked up we don't have a system in place yet to uh to respond and update the data so right now it's it's a lot of data in um and we don't yet have a system to update but that's that's kind of that's long term goal but we're not there yet we're uh we're still a bit behind that but that's like the final product that we're working towards so that will be there in the future but regards uh, uh, with the with, with, uh, do you uh, do you think uh, how how it is going to be done in the future? I mean, the data to be removed. Yeah. Um, well, you you could have a situation where, let's say, someone ahead of you has already marked the letter. When you open the map, you'll see that this letter has already been marked. So you could either confirm that it's still there, or if it's not there anymore, you could be the one to say, "Well, this is actually gone." So this data is there. It's been verified by two other three people. When you're there, it's not there anymore. So you could be the one to say it's gone. And then someone else could, could confirm that. So if you think about how blockchains work, when the, 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 the transaction has to be confirmed by a number of blocks, so too could citizen science data have to be confirmed um, and validated by a number of citizen scientists. And this is all part of the proof of work mining principle that i'm trying to work in with lettercoin so as people verify the data and do the work there's a there's a reward for participating in the network um but it's not just real-time data that's important there's a lot that can be gained from the historical time series data as well so what's missing right now is we need baseline data we need to pick a city we need to get 100 people out there we need to collect as much data as possible in in a day or in two or three hours and then hopefully we can revisit that and we can do it every week or every month. And if there's a change in policy, like here in Ireland, we were the first country in the world to introduce a ban on smoking cigarettes indoors. And this was championed as being a huge benefit for public health. But nothing was followed up with, well, what is the impact that this will have in bringing smokers outside and increasing cigarette litter? on the street which is now poisoning water quality everywhere you can you can sample any water quality of the of any city in the world and most of it is contaminated heavily by nicotine and uh, and and related chemicals so when there's a change in policy we need to follow up and say well how is this actually uh, changing the distribution of litter over time but to do that you need baseline data right now a lot of it is done by sampling so the sampling method Ology was developed because people couldn't cover a very large scales across space and time. But now everybody, where's my data collector? Everyone is one of these. Everybody has a device that can collect really powerful data. Um, so the sampling methodology was carefully constructed because we couldn't cover these large scales, whereas now we can. And litter and pollution in the environment are what some of the most topical and important issues that nearly everybody is familiar with today. And all we need to do is we need the right catalyst because people don't understand GIS yet. Most people don't understand the power of geographic information, the power of this thing that they carry around everywhere. And when we can empower huge numbers of people to share data and, and do what OpenStreetMap did, but for litter and plastic pollution, we can gather these huge data sets and we can evaluate, well, like how does litter change every day? Or, you know, if there's, if there's a new store that opens, there's a new, store here they sell alcohol products suddenly people are out drinking on the street well how has that changed broken glass that pets have to walk on and and you know uh, people in that have disabilities like have to um you know um you put up with it 
you know, extra obstacles on the road if you're in a wheelchair. One of the one of the common issues that I that I read about online is people in wheelchairs. One of their biggest problems is that their wheels of their chairs get covered in dog shit. Um, so you can put all that data on Open Letter Map and you can start educating society about like what their pets are doing when like they're not keeping a close eye on them or um, potentially enforcing um, fines. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't believe litter fines are the solution. I think education is the solution. I think the reason um, people uh, there's so much plastic in the environment is that people who use these products don't realize the huge environmental impacts they have. But um, that's another debate. It's, and different, you'll have different answers for different locations. So don't don't take what I say as gospel that it'll work in every location because it probably won't. So this open litter map, does it work on a similar uh, foundation as ODK Collect or Epi Collect? No, it's built from scratch. Um, those things typically are platforms that you can like build on top of. Uh, open Letter Map okay. is just Open Letter Map. So it's 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 a it's a web app with um, a Laravel PHP backend. Um, it's just its own standalone product. But different related apps can be built on top of Open Letter Map. So you can download all the data and build My City Letter app using our data and uh, potentially approach your local government with consultancy services saying i'm a gis expert and i know about this litter data and i can help you save time and money if you sign me up for a contract or you could potentially say um we also need more open source tools so one thing that i'd like to see is um an open letter map to qgis plugin that doesn't exist yet but i have to launch the open litter map api so um people can zoom in on a bounding box with Q, press the open letter map to QGIS button, and boom, they just get loads of open letter map data in their browser ready to go. Currently, you have to download the CSV and import it and join the tables and all this stuff. But um, right. I'd like to see I'd like to see a, a QGIS plugin. But no, they, it, it isn't built on top of anything else. It's not built on any other data collector. It's built from scratch. So I've been working on it for a long time. It looks like, Sean, um, there are a couple questions in um, the channel right above, or two channels above. It's called the No Mic Chat, and they're oh, yeah. kind of marked with, with keys. <laughs> just um, throughout the presentation, people have, have dropped them in there if you just want to take a look. Okay, cool. So how old is the data set? So Open Litter Map launched on the 15th of April, 2017, so it's nearly four years old. But most of the data has come in the last six months, I think. And so we've got a couple of super users who collect like 90% of the data and we might get one super new super user every four to six weeks. Um, but hopefully that trend will continue to improve. So most, although the data set's about four years old, uh, most of the data is probably six months old, but I haven't actually evaluated that. That's just my opinion. Um, but you know, the data is open. So if you want to download it and do an analysis and tell us um, what the data looks like, I'd love to see it. Uh, it would be cool to correlate this with the iNaturalist data set. It absolutely would. That is a um, a very good idea. And because our data is open, it empowers anyone to do that. And I'd love to see it. Uh, how many users and countries do you have? So we just passed 4,100 users. This month, we've nearly got 90 users in the last 10 days. Um, uh, we've got, I think, last time I checked, we have 80 countries. So if you're in a new, if you're in a country, if your country doesn't exist yet, just upload a photo and your country is going to be added automatically to the Open Letter Map database to the World Cup. And because we pull the uh, database from, or we pull those address values from OpenStreetMap, um, it also maintains native languages and alphabets in many locations. So China is in Chinese, Korea is in Korean, Myanmar is in language they use in Myanmar, I don't know, but it's a beautiful language, or uh, alphabet, uh, and so on, Greek, Hebrew, and a few others. Um, do you think there are economic disparities with reporting? I'm not sure what you mean by that, um, but different places definitely have uh, a different attitude and approach to reporting. They speak Burmese, thanks for clearing that up. Um, so here in Ireland, like, I'll focus on cigarette butts because they drive me nuts. They're everywhere. And I just like can't even go for a walk without every step being contaminated by a cigarette butt. And it just drives my my brain in. But um, a lot of people in, 
in other countries have much worse problems like piles of burning garbage um, or huge waste dump sites. So we last year we had a group from um, we had a group from Malawi in Africa, um, and they had a grant from the Open Knowledge Foundation to run an event um, on mapping waste dump sites. Uh, and they brought together their university campus, bunch of geography students, bunch of people learning GIS, and they, the, the facilitator uh, taught his students how to use Open Litter Map to map waste dump sites around Lilongwe, I think is the town in Malawi, and like huge piles. You can see it. You can go on the global map, visit uh, Malawi in just um, southeastern Africa, um, and and look at the, the location and the distribution and the abundance of waste dump sites. And they've got some different problems, but like different areas have, have very local specific problems. Um, but a, a, the whole world has, has litter. Like if there's nobody is getting away from it yet, but that's what we're here to fix. Uh, how much more time do you need to train the model? That's a very good question. I've been studying AI for about a year and I've just started. I have finished a really good book and I'm now ready to train the data set. Um, I hope to have um, a model ready. I'm waiting to get a new PC delivered that will actually train the convolutional neural networks. So once the new PC is delivered and there's huge shortages because of all these crypto mining farms that are taking all the GPUs away from researchers who actually need them. Um, uh i i hope in before the summer to have the first launch um uh released and um, that might be optimistic but um hopefully by the summer we'll have version one for the open letter ai uh that'd be really cool maybe version 0 0.1 we'll call it so re the universities many diverse many universities have sustainability departments that would love to collaborate that'd be really cool i'd love to see that um we i don't have the resources myself to email all of them but open letter map has been referenced um 10 or 11 times in different journals so more and more researchers are starting to take an interest in it we've been referenced in nature twice uh, and a few others so um i'd love to I'd, i would love to see a university mapping competition uh, and not one university in the world has had their litter map yet so the race is on to see who will be remembered excuse me in the hall of fame um, for mapping their, their litter pollution. That'd be really cool. So if anyone's part of a university or has uh, the interest in running a, a litter mapping group or a marathon, we call them litter mapping marathons, um, it'd be really cool to see. We don't know yet how much data can 10 or 20 people collect in an hour. Like that, That's how new citizen science is. Like we have no idea. Like, wh like what's, the, what's society's capacity of producing data right now? Like you've got how many millions of data collectors in a country um, and what are we, 0.1% if we're lucky on a good day? Um, so we need to start teaching society about how to collect data and building up those events. But those university events are going to be instrumental um, in coordinating people and bringing people together and getting them interested in uh, sharing data and using open platforms. So you mentioned the data can be downloaded by CSV. Will the layers eventually be available in other formats, including shapefiles? Yes. We're going to open up as much um, access to data as we can. Currently, it's only a CSV because I'm just doing this by myself. Um, and after the AI, after the gamification, my next plan is to work on the API. So you'll be able to make send a post request or a get request, whatever, some, some kind of request to open litter map. Uh, and you'll be able to get a filterable uh, GeoJSON request and we'll throw shapefiles in there and everything else. And hopefully that will go into the um, OLM2 QGIS plugin, which I'm, it's not on my radar, but uh, if someone wants to help me build that, I'd love to see an open source um, contribution made to the ecosystem and help people import data into Q nice and fast. We've got Lala Class heading away, see it, dude. And um, what else have we got? Yeah, I, I, so once the open litter AI launches, um, we're gonna. I'm I'm tempted to submit the data to either um, Kaggle or ImageNet. So ImageNet is the annual AI competition, um, and uh, that's where all of the biggest innovations in computer vision happen every year. Um, 
Uh, so I'd love to submit the data to ImageNet and get all the leading global researchers producing the best quality AI possible. Um, so we've got about 120,000 images and they've all been tagged. So the next part of the process is we need to label them with bounding boxes. And then when the bounding boxes are done, uh, we might label the actual outline of everything um, in really good quality resolution. And we're going to need help with that. And 